chapter 7 this morning, and I appreciate Brother Ray's comments, Brother Ray's comments about, about the, uh, the birthday gift for Jesus offering. That is going to be a tremendous accomplishment for our church family. There are, uh, there are multiplied thousands of cars that drive by our church every single day. Our neighborhood around us is, uh, I, at one point we were... Uh, expecting it to decline, quite frankly, but instead, uh, younger families are buying the homes, moving into the neighborhood, and uh, and we're seeing an increase uh, in the folks around us that uh, have needs and and are bringing children along the way, and all of them, the kids and their moms and dads need to know the Lord. So in that atrium, we're going to put an indoor playground uh, that will be the major entrance uh, to our uh, children's ministries. If you if you think about coming through the atrium, uh, back up the hallway, there's the uh, coming in that direction. There's the the stairway up to the elementary department. There's the walkway through to the preschool and the nurseries. And so it makes sense that that becomes a major entry for that. We're also going to uh, to uh, recreate uh, the south entrance of the of the Gilming Center and uh, put in uh, some glass doors. Make a an entrance. Uh, there that will uh, allow folks to to get in out of the weather. Uh, Right now, people with children, most of them end up parking on this back parking lot back here. And uh, it's a long ways to get from back here uh, to the kids' ministry by putting in uh, a new entrance on the south side of the Gilming Center, a covered a walkway, a drop-off place uh, where families can drop off their, uh, the mom can drop, uh, can, can come in with the kids or uh, a place where people can come in that way. The youth can meet, in, they, they meet in the gym now. The children can come right through there into that, uh, into the atrium. And uh, it just is going to be a tremendous advantage. Uh, that will allow us to put some additional uh, handicap parking in, uh, in both back here and uh, out here. And so uh, we're just going to meet a lot of needs. Our goal uh, is that we have two phases of the project. The atrium part uh, will take approximately 50,000, I think 48, 7, something like that. Uh, and then there will be another about 14000 to complete uh, the things that are necessary to get us uh, done on that south entrance with doors and covered walkway and all the things that have to happen in that direction. Uh, so uh, we are going to begin this project. We have $10,000 already in hand uh, for it. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. And uh, so we're almost 20% of what we need uh, in the project already. And uh, we're going to kick that project off with our birthday gift for Jesus offering. Uh, so uh, if you'll pray about what the Lord would have you to do, Jana and I, uh, every year we, we taught our kids this, that uh, the birthday gift for Jesus offering is just that. Christmas is about Christ. And so uh, we always want to give more to him than we do to anybody else at Christmas time. And that helps our family uh, keep Christmas at a... Uh, Uh, the perspective that it needs to be. And so I hope you'll consider what you can do, uh, what kind of a difference you can make. Here's what I believe. I believe that we'll see all kinds of young families. Can you imagine us having this uh, this indoor playground out here open a couple of three days during the week, maybe more uh, when uh, preschool parents, um, uh, moms can bring their kids uh, when the weather's really bad. Uh, they'll be able to come and bring their kids to that playground. And, of course, when they do, uh, that gives us the opportunity uh, to get acquainted with them and to do the, the most important thing, and that is to give the gospel. And uh, that, that'll open the doors into families. That's our goal, uh, is to reach this Jerusalem community of Cherry Street Baptist Church for those folks right under the umbrella, uh, or uh, under the shadow, I should say, of our church. What a great blessing uh, that we have. Uh, yesterday, if you'd have been here yesterday, this place was crawling like an anthill. Uh, there was a, uh, a homeschool Christmas program that went on yesterday that lasted uh, most of the afternoon. I mean, it was impressive. I uh, was able to be here for a good portion of it, and uh, uh, many of our church families were involved in that, and uh, it, was a, it was a blessing uh, for our church to be used uh, once again. Uh, to, to have our property used in that manner. So we're thankful uh, for the Lord allowing us uh, to uh, take part and make a difference uh, even outside of our own church family. And that's, that's a great blessing. 
That's a great blessing. Well, one of America's, we've heard some great music already this morning, by the way, and I cannot wait to hear the Christmas musical next week. Uh, I've met the fellow that, that did the arrangement of the musical, uh, and uh, I'll just tell you that, um, that you're going to be excited uh, about the music next Sunday. I have a dear friend who uh, was a state's attorney in Florida. His name's Bob. And uh, Bob was uh, a great fellow who was a self-proclaimed atheist. And Bob came to our Christmas musical because somebody was willing to give him an invitation. In fact, uh, he, he thought that, man, if, if, I can, if I'll just go on this Sunday, I'll get this guy off my back. And, uh, and he won't bother me. And I'm not going to have to listen to a preacher. Uh, I'll just listen to music, and I can tolerate that. I won't have to listen to a preacher. And that day, my atheist friend Bob trusted Christ as his Savior. And what I'm telling you is that there is an eternal opportunity, an opportunity uh, to make a difference for eternity in somebody's life. And uh, maybe one of the folks that you have on the cross over here that you've been praying for all year long, this is one more opportunity to invite them to come and to to hear the the music. And at the close of the musical, I'll give a brief gospel uh, uh, story and then invite them to come and trust. Christ as Savior, and I'm excited to see what God is going to do uh, next Sunday as a result of all the hard work. The choir, that wasn't even a song you're doing next week. Man, I thought it was. I was uh, oh, man, that was so good. I, I thought, I was fixed to brag about how good it's going to be, and that was part of it, and it turns out not to be, uh, but it was it was so good. Uh, I, I, I think one of, uh, and I'll talk to, I'm going to talk to you more about this over the next couple of weeks. Um, one of America's favorite songs this time of year is a classic, I'll Be Home for Christmas. The song was, was uh, written during World War II to honor the soldiers who wanted to be home at Christmas time. It's been sung by the likes of Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, Kelly Clarkson, and most recently... Uh, one of my favorite uh, recordings of it in the last couple of years, uh, are, are, it's by the Pentatonix. Uh, listen, listen to just a little bit of this, all right? Isn't that kind of cool? I, I like that. No, don't clap for that. We get in just under the copyright with that time frame that we just did. We don't have to pay any royalties uh, for doing it for that length of time. There's a, uh, so in case anybody's wondering about copyright infringement, there are, there's a certain amount of a clip you can play, and we got under just that, that much. The lyrics of this song make the promise. I'll be home for Christmas. You can plan on me. Please have toe snow. Please have toe and mistle snow. Uh, please have snow and mistletoe and presents on the tree. Promises. Promises. Easy to make. So hard to keep sometimes. One of the most famous promises, uh, and you hear it all the time, is... The check is in the mail. <laughs> Some of you will remember uh, in, in uh, 1988, Ronald Reagan had been president for eight years. The country had, uh, had seen a resurgence of patriotism and so many things. And, and uh, his vice president, George Bush, who just passed away on Friday night, uh, Bush made a promise on the campaign trail. He was, uh, he was being opposed by 
Uh, Bill Clinton, this, actually this is for his second uh, term. He'd already, been, uh, he'd already been elected for his first term. Uh, so this is when he's running against uh, Bill Clinton. And you might remember one of his great promises. He said this, read my lips. What? No new taxes. Historians tell us that probably he lost that re-election uh, because he made that promise in his first term and he compromised with Congress and raised uh, taxes during, that ter- during his first term. And it was brought up, brought up to him uh, by Pat Buchanan and later on by Bill Clinton. And historians say that that single phrase, that single promise probably is what kept uh, George Bush from being elected a second term as president. All of us, I guess, have heard the saying, promises were meant to be broken. Well, one of the greatest reasons that I think Christmas is uh, really is the most wonderful time of the year, to borrow uh, the title of another song, um, one of the the reasons I believe it's such a wonderful thing is because God always, always, always keeps His promises. God always keeps His promises. And so for three Sundays here in the month of December, we're going to look at passages from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah who makes a number of predictions concerning the coming of the Messiah. We're going to look at three of these prophecies uh, that one Bible scholar calls the Great Trilogy of Messianic Predictions. Uh, It simply means we're going to be talking about prophecies concerning the Messiah. Today in in Isaiah 7, uh, we're going to uh, look at the prophecy about how the Messiah was to be born. And in uh, in a couple of weeks, on on the 16th, uh, we'll be looking at Isaiah 9, uh, how we'll see how the Messiah will bless. And and on Christmas Sunday, on December the 23rd, we'll talk about how the Messiah will rule. It's going to be an exciting study. I'd like to ask you to read with me in Isaiah chapter 7. And while we're going to be talking a lot about the history around this today, I just want to read a few verses beginning in verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come, from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. Lord, we pray that you would help us in this moment uh, to really understand the context of Isaiah 7, 14. Lord, I pray that this morning that you would help us uh, to understand that you're a God who makes promises and the God who keeps them. And we're going to praise you for what you're going to do in that regard today. I pray, Lord, that those who are here today would be challenged and encouraged to know that they can trust you, that they can trust the promises that you've made, that they can trust you to accomplish in their lives what you intend to accomplish. Lord, I I pray that today there would be those who will understand and recognize that you love them, that you died for them. Lord Jesus, that you went to the cross to pay for their sins. And I pray that today they would come to know you as personal Savior. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. This morning and over the course of these three messages, I want you to listen for these words. 
Promise made, promise kept. Promise made, promise kept. Say those words with me. Promise made, promise kept. Say it again. Promise made, promise kept. When you hear these words, you can draw a line directly from the Old Testament to the New Testament. For the Old Testament is the promise made, and the New Testament is the promise kept. Every one of us can, can rest in the promises of God because as we'll see from the truths of today's passages, when it comes to God, promises made are promises kept. As we hear these words of Isaiah the prophet, I, I want us to get a, a sense of a detailed and accurate forecasting or prediction or prophecy of the one who was to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, let's talk about uh, what it means to see the future. What does it mean to see the future? One of the biggest predictions, prophecies, uh, has to do uh, with what Isaiah says in verse 14. Therefore the Lord shall himself shall give you a sign... Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The promise of God for the coming of the Messiah or or the anointed one was very well known and well documented among the Jews. Isaiah was not alone in clearly and explicitly proclaiming the Messiah. Uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, Micah, Zechariah, Malachi, all of these made prophetic promises concerning the coming of the Messiah. Now I want you to understand something. It is not an easy thing at all to predict the future. Right? It is not an easy thing at all. There are people today who make their living... Predicting the future. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, One of the first places I look to is ESPN. (laughs) On ESPN, at the beginning of this football season, we... There's a, a, some of the fellows here at the church, we're involved in a fantasy football league in which I am failing miserably. And at the beginning of the season, ahead of the season coming, there are uh, ESPN uh, has all of these uh, all of these guys. I, I mean, I could start naming the names that wouldn't mean anything any more to you than they do to me. And guys who who supposedly really understand the game of football. And I want you to know that those experts picked those who would be in the Super Bowl. Now, I want you to understand how precise this science is. The science of projecting who's going to be in the future, uh, in the future Super Bowl, the one that's going to happen here on the first Sunday or so of February. Uh, Listen to this. These ESPN experts, this science is so precise. Let me tell you who they predicted. They predicted the Panthers, the Jaguars, the Chiefs, the Rams, the Packers, the Vikings, the Patriots, and the Falcons. As winners, not just to go to the Super Bowl, those were the guys who were picked to win it all. That is a full 25% of the NFL. This is a, this is a pure science, just let me tell you. In the field of American presidential politics, there are people who make their living predicting the future. And almost none of them got it right in 2016 when Donald Trump was elected uh, to be the president. Economists today are all over the map. Some economists, if you take the time to read about it, and I Googled it. I mean, of course, Google is is where you find everything, right? I, I, I looked it up, and I want to tell you, economists are crazy. There are economists out there who are predicting a bright economic future, and some are predicting doom and gloom, and they're all looking at the same data. The practice of forecasting the future is daunting. And of course, we cannot forget all of our favorites, the weatherman. (laughs) And just let me tell you, 
The weather people in the Ozarks drive me crazy. I actually called one of them one time. Because every time a cloud would come up in the north and the west, they would predict snow and some of y'all would stay home. And it was going to be 70 that day. They, I mean, I, I listen to the, to the news and the weather on Saturday nights, and I can't tell you how many times a year that these crazy weather people, whom I love, and I hope know Jesus as their Savior because they, I want them to go to heaven. At that point, they're going to be perfect, and they'll never be perfect before then. But I called one of them one time, and I said, Look, would you stop saying that people just probably ought to stay home if you don't have to go somewhere tomorrow for, on Sunday. It's not a work day. And this one guy was saying this over and over. It's not a work day. If you can stay home, you probably ought to stay home and out of the weather. And I'm saying, good night. You're talking about dew. We're going to have a dew storm? <laughs> now... To be fair, maybe you didn't know this, but according to Forbes magazine's list of America's wildest weather cities and the Weather Variety Index, Springfield is the city with the most varied weather in the United States. We have that distinction. For example, on May 1st of 2013, Springfield reached a high of 81 degrees. By the evening of the next day, May the 2nd, snow was falling. It persisted uh, into the following day, accumulating two inches on the 2nd and 3rd of May. Welcome to Springfield. <laughs> Chicago is known as the Windy City. But according to the Center for Climate Data, Springfield has comparable surface wind velocity as Chicago. So maybe, just maybe, we need to give these weather people uh, in Springfield a little slack when it comes to accuracy. <laughs> Did you know there was an interesting experiment back in the 90s? A Pennsylvania uh, University professor gathered two distinct, distinct groups of people together. He got hundreds of experts on one hand and a, a group of ordinary people. They were well-read people, but they were ordinary people on the other. And he asked them to, tw to try to predict uh, items of global significance. What will happen to the stock market in the next year? What impact uh, will Middle Eastern politics have on oil prices in the next six months? Uh, what's going to happen in North Korean politics? This was known as the Good Judgment Project. This experiment showed that the predictions of ordinary people have often outperformed the experts. Sometimes these ordinary but well-read people were better than intelligence officers who have access to classified data. What am I saying? What I'm saying is it is really, really hard to predict the future. But the Bible does it regularly. In the scriptures... Few make the, sh the sheer number of predictions that Isaiah does. The book of Isaiah alone, according to one uh, author that I read, contains 111 separate prophecies. So if it's hard to predict the future, how in the world does the Bible accomplish it? Well, let me give you two reasons. The first is because the Bible claims to be the very word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. These are not ordinary, well-read men. This is the God of the universe who is making these claims. Secondly, God not only knows the future, but God controls the future. Isaiah 46 and verse 9 says, Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. 
Why can God do it? How can the Word of God uh, predict all this? Because God's the one who wrote it. God is the author of all of it. God does not simply know the future in advance. God knows the future as history. The president has political power. The, the multimillionaire has financial power. The general has military power. The scholar has intellectual power. But God has universal power. Now, I want you to understand this morning, the very first prediction of the Messiah coming was given to us way back in Genesis. It, you could even say that it was the first Christmas sermon. In Genesis 3.15, uh, God is saying to the devil, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed, your offspring, and her seed, her offspring. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the first promise, the first prophecy found in the Bible. Now, I want you to, to understand, the Word of God places a lot of significance on the prophecies and the predictions of the Old Testament. Acts 3 and verse 18 says, But those things which God before showed by the mouth of all His prophets, that Christ should suffer, He hath so fulfilled. How were the earliest believers so sure that Jesus was the coming Messiah? Peter tells us how. The answer is the predictions of the Old Testament all pointed to Jesus Christ. There are over 300 prophecies scattered in the Old Testament about the Messiah that was to come. And so it's important for us to see how these predictions work together in today's text. I want us to, to look at the, the history around Isaiah chapter 7 and see how Ahaz the king acts badly when he's confronted with accurate forecasting of his own future and his nation's future. What is your reaction to God's predictions of future events, Ahaz? That's really uh, what's going on here. So not only do we need to see the future what we're going to see from Ahaz is that we need to live the faith. We need to live the faith. Most everyone here has heard of Jesus' birth. The idea of the virgin birth is first recorded right here in Isaiah. And yet to know the backstory to God's prediction and this miracle, you've got to know the story of two men, Ahaz and Isaiah. Ahaz is the first king of the nation of Judah when this prophecy is made. And our story happens between 735 and 715 B.C. He was 20 years old when he came to power. And according to 2 Kings chapter 16 and verse 2, he ruled for 16 years. Even though he had a godly grandfather and a godly father, Ahaz was an evil king. And he vacillates when he's confronted with what God is going to do. He even sacrificed his son uh, as an offering to an idol. This is not a good man. This is not a godly king. And yet, despite all this, Ahaz's biggest claim to fame, you know what it is? He is listed in the family tree of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. That's right. This wicked king is listed in Jesus' family tree. Isaiah here, well, this is Ahaz. Isaiah is one of history's greatest men. Isaiah was a counselor to kings. He was a contributor uh, to the Bible uh, uh, himself. He, he is one of those that God used to pen uh, the words of the book uh, that we're reading today. Isaiah's Old Testament book is quoted more than any other book in the New Testament except for the Psalms. In fact, Jesus chose a passage from Isaiah's writing to preach his first recorded sermon. There is a remarkable contrast between these two men, Ahaz and Isaiah, as they are standing on the outskirts of the ancient city of Jerusalem. The prediction of the virgin birth comes because Ahaz... It is just determined that he's going to be self-reliant. 
If you go back to verse 2 in, in, in Isaiah 7, you're going to see uh, that Isaiah describes the emotional state of the king as shaking, as, as a forest shakes with the wind. Uh, he, his heart was moved and the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind, it says. The year here is 732 B.C., there's an alliance of nations that's conspired together and they're threatening Ahaz and his tiny nation of Judah. Looming on the horizon is a massive empire to the east, the Assyrians. The Assyrians are, are threatening to come against uh, these other nations. Uh, and uh, so Israel, also called Ephraim, not to be confused with Judah, all right, Israel and Syria... Uh, join together, and their combined forces, they want to fight Assyria. And yet, they, they want the collaboration of Ahaz. They want Ahaz, Ahaz to join because he's threatened as well. as That's their perception. He's threatened, so they want him to come and be a part of this defense against the Assyrians that are coming their way. Well, when he... Ahaz begins to drag his feet and ultimately refuses to join. Israel and Syria determine they're going to attack Judah, remove Ahaz from the throne, put a king on the throne then who will join their coalition. Ahaz gets intelligence reports uh, telling them that troops are massing on their, uh, on their borders just north of them in 2 Chronicles 28. Everybody's panicked, including Ahaz. That's what it's talking about in verse 2. They're all shaking as the, the, the trees in the, in the wind. Ahaz knew that his little country was no match for these bullies who were coming after him. And with all this going on, Listen to what Isaiah the prophet told the king down in verse 4. God said to Isaiah in verse 3 and in verse 4, Say to Ahaz, take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted. Now the king's advisors were telling him, You better make a, 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 an alliance with these most powerful nations. In fact, some of them were saying, you need to join up with Assyria even. But God, out of his boundless love, and because of the promise that he had made, we'll talk about that in a minute, God s uh, sends Isaiah to speak to the king and say, don't panic. Be quiet. Be faint-hearted. At the end of verse 4, he compares these threatening nations to smoking firebrands. I wasn't exactly sure what that was, so I kind of looked it up. And, and, and it's the idea of burned-out embers like you'd see it at a campfire. Uh, he says they're, they're nothing more than just, uh, just these uh, sparks that go up in the wind. They're, they're like a burning stump almost. In other words, what Isaiah is telling him is to stay clear of any political alliance for this is more a matter of faith than it is of politics. You, you need to understand that. Look at what uh, Isaiah said at, at the end of verse 9. He says, If ye will not believe, ye surely shall not be established. Now this is one of the first statements that I believe you ought to underline in your Bible this morning. Do you, do you see that at the end of verse, uh, of verse 9? Isaiah is telling Ahaz that if you don't believe the word of God, you're going to have a problem. If you are not firm, if you will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. What he's saying is, if you're not firm in faith, you're not going to be firm at all. If you're not firm in faith, if you don't trust God right now, you don't have anything else to trust. Here we see the importance of faith. This king only had a little faith. By the way, do you know what real faith is? Faith knows that God is more real than the things immediately in front of us. 
Faith wants God more than the things immediately in front of us. And if we're not firm in our faith, then we're not firm at all. If you don't nail down where your confidence is, if you don't nail down where your faith is, what your faith is, uh, what the object of your faith is, then you will allow the events of life to sweep you over every time the tide comes in. Now, most of our problems happen like this. Small God, big problems. Small God, big problems. It's only when God is big that our problems become small. When you lean on God, you've got all the help you need. And so here we see the Lord speaking through the prophet to Ahaz. Isaiah tells him in verse 10, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. What he's saying is there is nothing too big. God is is giving you the opportunity to ask whatever you want. You can ask God for anything. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too small. This is a blank check. Imagine the possibilities. The king could have asked for the sun to go backwards 10 degrees or to let the moon stop in its tracks. Perhaps he could have asked for the stars to temporarily arrange themselves in the king's favorite geometric geometric design. Imagine that he could have just spoken and asked God just to zap somebody. You ever want to just zap somebody? When I was in high school, I had a... a, uh, a, a, a choir director. He was uh, he was an amazing guy, Clayton Lacroix. He's a, he's a friend. I still talk to him once in a while. He's retired and in really poor health over in South Carolina. But I can't tell you how many times, I, Brother Lacroix. We we had a huge choir, and a, and I mean we, this was a choir we got to sing in Washington D.C. It was a great a great group of people to be involved with, and he's just an incredible guy. But I cannot tell you how many times. That he would look up there and somebody wouldn't be watching him. You know, choir is supposed to not watch what's going on out here. I mean, if you're really uh, what you need to be as a musician, uh, a choral musician should have their eyes on the director 100% of the time. And uh, I was, I, I, <laughs> when I first started in choir, I was trying to sing bass, which is really funny. Uh, but I got moved to tenor relatively quickly. And, and, but I remember one day that I was not watching him. Something had caught my eye. And he looked over at me and he said, I am going to pinch your head off. <laughs> I think he meant it too. I, I mean, I really did. I, I think if, if, if at that moment God had said to him, you can have anything you want to have, he would have like z- just zapped my head off. King Ahaz was given an opportunity. He had an an invitation from Almighty God to ask for a sign, something, whatever the king needed for confirmation, whatever he needed to shore up his weak faith, whatever he needed so that he would believe what the prophet was telling him. But instead, look at how he answers in verse 12. I mean, he pretends humility here. He says, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. God handed him a blank check, and he refused to cash it. Now, can I say to you this morning that Christmas poses a question to all of us? And the question is this. Do you trust in the promises of God, or do you choose the path of self-reliance? Do you trust in the promises of God or do you choose the path of self-reliance? We'll ask it a different way. Shadow put it up on the screen. Will you assume the risk of trusting God even in the areas of life that really matter? Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace 
whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. I'm going to say this again. Remember, faith knows God is more real than the things in front of us. God is more real than the things that you can see. And faith wants God more than the things that we can see. Wants God more than the things that are in front of us. So the third thing I want you to see this morning is Ahaz didn't didn't do it, but he should have seized the sign. He should have seized the sign. Isaiah is indignant with the king. God was exasperated by the king. In place of just any sign then, God determines what the sign is going to be. And we see that sign in verse 14. Therefore, because you didn't ask for a sign, you with me? Because you did not in faith ask for a sign, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now let me show you how this sign works or or how this sign functions. Notice in in verses 2 and and verse 13, God refers to the house of David. He's calling uh, the king. He's talking about Ahaz and he's talking about the house of David. Can I say uh, that when when the Bible talks about the house of David, he's doing so much more than reminding us of a great king. He is reminding us of a great promise. And that promise is found back in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verses 12 and 13. Uh, And God says, when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, this is he's saying this to David, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You see, this was no ordinary child. Uh, that was going to be born. This was no ordinary king. Uh, This wasn't going to just be any other king. This sign from heaven meant that God would again fulfill his promise. A virgin shall conceive, and her child shall be of the house of David. Now, despite the fact that it was going to take 750 years to fulfill, God will not allow even one of his promises to be extinguished. Promise made, promise kept. The way, and this is what I want you to see. The way that the prophets looked at the future was often the way we look at a mountain range with distant mountains and closer mountains in the, in the range. All of them kind of looking like just one mountain. You know what I'm talking about? You start driving to the mountains and you see the mountains on the horizon and, and that the closer you get, you, you realize, and maybe you start driving in or around or over those mountains and you realize it wasn't one mountain you were seeing. It was mountains. It was a mountain range that you were seeing. Well, these prophets, all of them looked like one mountain from up close. So rather than having a sign of faith to confirm the king's lack of trust, now he's told that despite the immediate consequences of his actions, despite how things look, despite what you think, uh, the Assyrians are not going to wipe you out. Uh, the, uh, the Judah and, and Syria, they're not going to, they're not going to, Ephraim and Syria are not going to wipe you out either. God is going to be true to his promise. So he says, I'm going to give you the sign. And the sign is this, that the promise that I made to David, your great-great-grandfather, I'm going to keep that promise long beyond your time here on this earth. And let me tell you what it's going to be like. Look down at verse 14, or verse 15. He says, butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse evil and choose uh, the good. For the child... For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Now concerning the baby of the virgin in verses 15 and 16, the prophecy means four things. First of all, it tells us that it's going to be a male child. 
that he's going to be given the unique name Emmanuel, God with us. Three, the third thing that it's going to mean is that he's going to grow up in humble circumstances. Meaning his diet is going to consist of butter or, or that also could be translated curds and honey. And lastly, before he reaches full maturity, the two nations that you are, that you are fearing right now, they're not even going to be around. They're not going to be a threat. And so we see I, God is making a promise. You're not, you're not gonna, you don't want a sign. I'm going to give you the sign. And, by, and the sign that I'm going to give you is a promise that is going to be fulfilled in the future. And so God makes him this promise. And then we see the results of his self-reliance. Verse 17, the Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come. From the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. The king turned God aside and his opportunity passed before him. But I want you to see in the second range that God promises this long-term blessing. God is going to do something for the long term. In, in these days out in the future, the Lord shall bring upon uh, thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come. Well, when's that going to happen? Days that have not come. Well, look over at Matthew. Matthew 1, verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Promise made, promise kept. Did you know that there is no recorded birth in Scripture after the birth of Jesus? Did you know that the last genealogy that's listed in, in the New Testament is that of the Lord Jesus? Why is that? Because that's the entire Bible. From Genesis to Malachi, the whole thing pointed to the birth and to the name of Jesus Christ. And so, this morning, Christmas asks this question. Do you trust the promises of God? Or do you vacillate? Put it back up there, Shed. Will you assume the risk of trusting God even in the areas of your life that really matter? A man visited a church service one time where this pastor spoke on this virgin birth. This conception uh, by the Holy Spirit. Mary's conception by the Holy Spirit. This man was a skeptic. And he came up to the pastor after the service and says, I don't believe that story one bit. And he said, honestly, pastor, I don't think you do either. The preacher kind of looked at him. The man continued this way. He said, suppose a young woman about six months pregnant came walking into your office and said, pastor, I'm expecting a baby. This is my boyfriend and he's never laid a hand on me. I conceived this baby miraculously by the Holy Spirit. Would you believe her? And this skeptical man thought that the pastor would surely say no. To his surprise, though, the pastor said, yes, I would believe it. And then after a dramatic pause, he said, I would believe it if that birth had been foretold by prophets thousands of years before the baby was conceived. Yes, I would believe it if an angel visited this boyfriend and said, Don't be afraid to take this woman as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is the Holy Spirit. Yes, I would believe it if, uh, uh, if when the baby was born, or after that, wise men traveled from afar and brought gifts to worship him, and the star guided them to right where the baby was at that time. Yes, I would believe it, he said. If her son had power over the wind and the waves and diseases and even death, yes, I would believe it if her son died on a cross and was raised three days later. You see, Christmas asks the question, 
Do you trust the promises of God or do you vacillate? Will you assume the risk of trusting God even in the areas of life that matter the most? This morning, I'm I'm pretty sure there's not a person here who has been virgin born. And because of that fact, we're all sinners. You see, when Jesus came into this world, he was born without sin. And he lived a perfect life without sin. He left heaven and came to this earth. The Son of God took upon him flesh and he became a man. And Jesus was, lived that perfect life, God the Son, and then he died on a cross to pay the debt of your sin and my sin. And as I told someone yesterday, the issue for us is not whether or not we're guilty. You're guilty. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He didn't, come in to con- he didn't come into the world to condemn the world. We- Jesus came not to condemn the world. The world's condemned already. Why? Because we're sinners. But God's promise is that a virgin would conceive and bear a son. And that son's name would be called Emmanuel. He would be God with us. And Jesus walked on this earth, lived like us. Uh, He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And when he died on the cross and paid the price for your sin and mine, the three days later he rose from the grave and he lives today testifying to you that he loves you. He did it for you. You've been born once if you're born once and only once you're going to die twice you're going to die physically and the bible says there's a second death in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone but the bible tells us that we must be born again not of water we were already born physically but you have to be born of the spirit you have to receive the gift of eternal life That's how you become a child of God. You're born into his family. That happens when you come to Jesus, acknowledging you're a sinner, recognizing that he died for you, and unlike the king who refused to ask in faith, you simply, in faith, ask Jesus to be your Savior, to forgive you of your sins. And the Bible says... Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Bow your heads with me this morning, if you would, please. Promises made, promises kept. How many of you are here today and you say, Dennis, I I have definitely had that promise made and the promise has been kept to me today, if I were to die today, I know I'm on my way to heaven because I believe the promise he made me that if I would call upon him, he would save me. And I know that if I die today, I'm going to heaven. And you would say, I'm a member of Cherry Street Baptist Church. Slip your hand up real high. Say, that's me. I'm, I'm saved and I'm a member of Cherry Street Baptist Church. Hold it up for just a minute if that's the case. A lot of folks like that. Thank you so much. Maybe here today and you'd say, Dennis, I've got that same precious faith. I'm not a member of Cherry Street, but I have been born into the family of God. I'm one of God's kids, and I'm not ashamed of that one bit. I'm thankful to know that Jesus is my Savior. Would you slip up your hand and say, I want to give testimony to that fact as well. Uh, Folks like that all over the place, God bless you. A lot of folks like that. If you're here this morning and you're living in Springfield, thank you. And the surrounding areas, we would invite you uh, to come and be a part of Cherry Street Baptist Church. If you don't have a church home, you ought to have one. Why don't you pray where you are right now? Lord, what would you have me to do about my church membership? And if the Spirit speaks to you this morning, we invite you to come on this very first invitation song we're about to sing. Maybe this morning you would say, Preacher, I am one of God's kids, but I am really having trouble trusting God for the things that really matter in my life. I've got, there are things in my life I'm struggling with. There are things I'm 
I, I am dealing with, and I'm, I'm happy to trust God with my eternal soul because I'm not necessarily looking eternity in the face, but the problems that I'm looking in the face right now, I'm having trouble trusting God with those. Preacher, would you pray for me today? I'd be happy to do that. Just slip up your hand if that's the case with you. I've got some real things I'm having trouble trusting the Lord with. Okay, I'll pray for you. Sure will. Sure will. Maybe here this morning you could not raise your hand on any of the previous propositions because truth is you're not sure that if you died today you'd go to heaven. You're not sure that you've been forgiven. You're not sure that you've been born into God's family, but you'd say, Preacher, I want that more than anything. I want to know for sure that heaven is my eternal home. How many of you slip up your hand and say, that's me? I, I, I want it more than anything. Yes, ma'am, I'll pray for you. Absolutely. Somebody else, pray for me. I'm not sure about it, but I want to be sure. Pray for me. I want to know it. Yes, sir, I will. Thank you. Somebody else, pray for me. I'm not sure about it. Yes, ma'am, I'll pray for you. Yes, sir, thank you. Yes, sir, I'll pray for you too. Thank you so much. Will you stand to your feet with me this morning? Lord Jesus, in this place today, there are some of your kids, some who are already members of your family, who are struggling with just the difficult things in their life. They're, they admit they're having trouble trusting you with the important things. I pray, Lord, on this first verse of invitation that they would come and cast their care upon you because you care for them. I pray that they would come and spend some time with you here at these altars. Lord, I pray for those who are here today who may need a church home. God, if you've spoken to their hearts, we invite you to come. We, Lord, we ask that you'd speak to their hearts and, and, and that you would help them as they come today. We'd be so happy to have them as part of this church family. Lord, I pray they would come according to your moving in their life. God, there's a number of people in this place today who do not know you as Savior. They're not sure of, of forgiveness of sin. And I pray for the, the lady and, and the man and, and the others that raised their hands this morning and And maybe some who did not raise their hands but know in their hearts that they're not sure that they've been forgiven, that they're on their way to heaven. I pray, Lord, that they would know it before they leave today. I pray that they would step out from where they are in just a moment and join many others who will be coming, meet one of our pastors who will be here at the front and allow someone to take the Bible and show them how they can receive the gift of eternal life, be forgiven of their sins on their way to heaven, even before they leave this place today, they can know that. May no one leave as the invitation is extended, and may no one go away without Jesus is our prayer today. And it's in his precious name that we pray. The Holy Spirit spoken to you this morning. We invite you to come right now. Do business with the Lord right now as we sing. Come just as you are. You want to trust the Lord as your Savior? Why don't you come?